Okay, so for this one, we're going to try to go through just a little bit quicker. Um, uh, I'll have to discipline myself and not go off on as many tangents. Um, just to give you an idea now, okay, Darwin, born in 1809, dies in 1882. He was born during the reign of King George III. Here in the U.S., we know King George III as the king during the American Revolution. Um, the sort of socioeconomic development in Europe was that you know, they were sort of right in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. The important thing about the Industrial Revolution for our purposes is that it was generating this middle class, this middle class of merchants, teachers, lawyers, doctors, etc. Darwin's father was actually a medical doctor, so had, you know, a bit of means. Um, this allowed Darwin to sort of persist or pursue some of his uh, scientific, you know, interests. Um, those of you who have, how many of you have watched the Darwin's Dangerous Idea? You get a notion for this in the video, in the Darwin's Dangerous Idea video. You, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't, you know, hard pressed uh, to find a career as soon as he could and start providing. He was, he kind of, he was kind of a, a bit of a wanderer, in, an intellectual wanderer that we're going to see here um, in the next couple of slides. Darwin was an avid sort of naturalist, right? He loved to go out, hike around, collect beetles and eggs and minerals and shells. He had a, he had a real sort of insatiable, insatiable curiosity for the natural world. This was sort of where his... his but, well, you know, with a lot of us, you know, even to this day, sometimes we really like to do something, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can make a career of it, right? You may really like to go look for Pokemon, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean you can provide, you know, a future in retirement with doing Pokemon. So Darwin, like some of us, have to, you know, we had to come to the harsh conclusion that we got to select a career where we're actually going to make some money. His father was a doctor, so the, na the natural sort of uh, profession for him was going to be becoming a doctor. So at age 16, he, he enters Edinburgh University uh, to study medicine. Pretty quickly, he realized that he just didn't have the stomach for it, right? He was intelligent, right? He wasn't that good of a study. He didn't study. He wasn't a really great student, right? But he had, he was obviously pretty intelligent. But even more so, if you think about this time period and, and you know, what surgery meant during this time period, he had to sit on a couple of surgeries. It was, you know, kind of a, not a real pleasant experience, really bloody, right? Anesthesia was like, you know, a shot of whiskey or something, a lot of screaming, a lot of blood all over. And Darwin, you know, as we see, he, he didn't really have the strongest stomach in the world. And so he was like, no, this isn't for me. This is too gory. You know, he was more delicate. He was a little bit more delicate than that. So he, you know, started thinking, okay, took him a couple of years. But he was like, all right, I'm just not cut out to be a doctor. Right? I'm not cut out to be a medical doctor. But I really like the outside world. I like natural history. So at that time, if you're really into natural history and things, a pretty good career was to become a, um, a country parson. I failed to mention, though, the one thing that was, you know, it wasn't like his, Darwin's time at Edinburgh University was, was a total waste. He was able to uh, see the talks, uh, uh, a series of talks, by the American naturalist James John Audubon, and this was sort of really sort of motivated him um, and inspired him again into uh, you know his in, in his interest in the natural world. We know Audubon from what? Does anybody know who? Does anybody know who James John Audubon was? He started a society, the Audubon Society. What is the Audubon Society? Study. Anybody know? Yeah, birds, ornithology, right? And so, again, sort of bringing Darwin to uh, that position. So he decides, okay, I'm going to become a country park. Because, because what becoming a country parson did was it allowed the person who's interest in sort of natural history of the natural world allowed them time to follow that interest and at the same time make a little make a living right and so what you would do is if you're a country parson you you know had your congregation uh, you know church of england and you'd do your sunday 
Sunday sermons, right? But during the rest of the week, what are you doing? You're developing your sermons. You're, you know, maybe walking around the countryside, looking at nature, visiting like widows in their little villages, in their little in their little cottages or whatever, right? But you, but it give you a lot of time to do that. We saw that even here in the Americas, and you know, even into the 1940s and 50s, there were a lot of sort of country parsons that. That's what they did. I think I mentioned this. Did I mention this in genetics just the other day? Yeah. So, uh, how many of you have ever seen the film A River Runs Through It? Anybody? It's like one of the best films ever. Brad Pitt, right? What is Brad Pitt character? What does he do? What is what is the story about? If you had to say two things, what is the story about? Fishing, fly fishing in Montana, right? And Brad Pitt's father, so it's these three brothers. No, am I getting... Legends of the Fall mixed up. <laughs> there was the two brothers. Was it two brothers? No, I think, yeah, I think there were two brothers, right? Brad Pitt was the older, wild brother, right? But anyway, he, uh, his father is what? What's the profession of his father? And his father teaches him fly fishing. That was their, like, you know, they were, most of their existence centered around fly fishing, right? And he was a pastor. He was your country parson, country pastor, who would walk around with his kids fly fishing. And they and, they, and there's even scenes in the movie where he's sort of, you know, describing God's creation, right? And that was a natural thing. You're going to throughout the week, go look at and describe and, you know, design parables based on the natural world and then preach it on Sunday. And so this is Darwin. This is exactly what Darwin wanted to do, right? He wanted to have a nice, quiet life out in the country and then be able to preach it. So he enters uh, Christ College in Cambridge in uh, 1828. Um, he, uh, it was obviously, this is, this is actually a picture of his apartment, I think, there on the right, on that second floor. Um, and, but then he begins to study to become a... He was a very average student, solid C, C minus student. He didn't really get really great grades. He didn't have a great GPA. Uh, part of it maybe was due to him spending most of his time hunting, shooting, drinking with his friends and collecting beetles rather than you know doing his studies. But he did make two really important, um, really, uh, meet two really important people that were very influential. One of them was geologist Adam Sedgwick. Sedgwick, Sedgwick you know, became, uh, is known for developing some of the geological epics, I believe. And then also botanist John Henslow, he took a trip to Sedgwick to Wells, a ge geology road trip, and this was very, very influential with him. Again, those are sort of the things that he was interested in. Um, he didn't end up, long story short, he didn't end up becoming a country parson. So maybe we'll stop here for now. And we'll pick this up on Friday. With with Adam Sedgwick. So we went on the road trip with Sedgwick. Yeah, I, I don't know if Hens, if Henslow went also, but Henslow comes in later in being instrumental in getting Darwin aboard the Beagle. Uh, and so we'll talk about him a little bit more. But but it was but it was Sedgwick that uh, that you know took him up to North Wales on the geology. Okay, so now here Darwin is, right? He graduates, you know, he doesn't graduate top of his class. He graduates on the lower half of his class. He wasn't that great of a student. He spent a lot of time doing things that he liked to do, which is like running around nature, collecting things. He'd always liked to do that, even from, an er from his early childhood. But he graduated, had his degree, right? But he still wasn't sure what he wanted to do. It's not, you know, not that dissimilar to a lot of, students today, right? You graduate, you get your degree, and then you're like, oh, do I really want to do this, or do I not want to do this, right? He has his degree, though. He's kind of floundering around. Luckily for Darwin, though, uh, through his friendship with Henslow, and then also through his uncle, uh, uh, his uncle uh, by the name of Wedgwood, which, for those of you who watched the video, will also notice is the same last name as who? Wedgwood? Has anybody ever heard of the Wedgwoods before? They make China. There's some really. There's, I guess it's still being. It's still manufactured today. It's like really top end China. So Wedgwood was also the last name of Emma, who became Darwin's what? Wife. Okay. So Darwin ended up marrying his first cousin, which wasn't totally uncommon back then. Um, 
but definitely more common than it is now in most places. Um, but his uncle, he was influential. They were sort of, Darwin's family was upper middle class, right? The Wedgwoods made this China. They made a bunch of money uh, doing that. Darwin's father was a doctor. So they were upper middle class, sort of classic wigs of the, of the uh, Industrial Revolution time period. Um, through his uncle and through Henslow, uh, he was uh, sort of given the opportunity to become the nat a naturalist aboard a ship called the HMS Beagle. Okay, the naturalist was a, a kind of an interesting position aboard the ship, and we'll talk about it here in a second. But the captain was a guy by the name of Captain Fitzroy. So Captain Fitzroy, Darwin had to uh, go down for an interview with Fitzroy. He wasn't sure he wanted to do it. He was kind of like, didn't have much else to do, and so he kind of ended up saying, okay, I'll go down for the interview. He goes down, he meets uh, Captain Fitzroy. He's immediately like, you know, impressed with Captain Fitzroy. Captain Fitzroy was impressed with Darwin's enthusiasm, and so they hit it off really well, and Fitzroy offers the position of naturalist to Darwin. Even though they kind of came from two different, um, two different uh, backgrounds, Darwin, upper middle class Whig, Fitzroy was an aristocrat Tory, okay? He, his, that, the Fitzroy family came from, uh, I think, uh, an illegal or an illicit liaison between Charles II and the Duchess of Cleveland, right? So he's kind of part of this aristocracy, uh, sort of blue-blooded. Blue he's high, very, very religious, very, very strict, very, very ordered. And what impressed Darwin is he was like, he'd never, he'd never come into contact or known somebody that had just sort of this quiet dignity and just extremely well-mannered, okay? Eventually decides, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take this naturalist position. The naturalist position, like I mentioned earlier, was, an, was sort of an interesting position because in the British Navy, you had the captain, right, and then you had different officers, and then you had the crew. These were all military positions. So on the ship, and, and, and you'll see the, the Beagle was out for five years, but it wasn't uncommon to be out for a long, long period of time. If you're out on the seas, you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're in dangerous situations, it's really important from sort of a military and from just an operational perspective that you have absolute sort of discipline there. So the captain was sort of, you know, the judge, jury, and executioner. Um, one big fear in the, during this time, not only with the British Navy, but with French Navy, the Portuguese Navy, everybody else, is that the crew would mutinize, okay? And so the captains really had to form this really strict, strict, uh, sort of discipline with the crew, with with the crew, and they couldn't really fraternize with the crew. You can't really go and eat with the crew and joke around with the crew, and then have to be sort of this, you know, basically this dictator aboard the ship. And so what they were finding, these are two links. We won't look at them now, but they're two links. One is to um, mutiny on the bounty. Has anybody ever seen that old black and white show? Anybody? No. Christian Fletcher. Anybody read the book? No. Okay. Well. If you're interested, go look at it and, it, and it and it depicts. Has anybody ever heard, even in just like a Simpsons episode or something, a reference to Captain Bly? No, Captain Bly is from Mutiny on the Bounty, and it has a good sort of illustration of how sort of tyrannical the captains had to be. And eventually, what happens is Christian Fletcher and the other crew mutinize against Captain Bly, and then they stow away to an island in the South Pacific with some Tahitian ladies, and they start a colony there. Okay, that's that story. A more recent one. Hopefully, somebody's seen this. Has anybody ever seen Master and Commander? Okay, yeah, okay. So, what's, so, Master and Commander is another more recent one that sort of shows you the position of the naturalist. So, the naturalist in, that, in Master and Commander is a little bit like Darwin. And you know, there's even some scenes where he's like collecting um, specimens on the island and he almost gets left on the island. Do you, you remember that scene? Anyway, there's some elements of Darwin to that. So, the naturalist, so the function of the naturalist then was to come aboard and not be part of that military hierarchical structure, but to have some function. The function was to go and collect all of these different organisms, all the flora and the fauna of the places they would go, ship them back to museums, 
the Natural History Museum or the British Museum in London uh, serve that function, but then also a main function was just to kind of be the friend of the captain. What was happening with the captains is that because they were so isolated and they were so isolated for a long period of time, they had a huge, a high rate of suicide. So they'd get depressed. Fitzroy himself suffered from de depression and did, in fact, eventually commit suicide. Um, and so not, not while he was on, aboard his ship, but later on in life. He had a history of suicide in his family, right? Um, so the naturalist, Darwin gets hired to the naturalist. He can then eat with the captain at night. He can talk. He can have, be somebody the captain can talk to. And then he also has sort of the other function of c collecting, you know, the flora and fauna and do these natural history sort of investigations for the museums. Has anybody ever been to any of the British museums, Museum of Natural History of the British Museum? or the Louvre in France. A lot of our sort of our big time museums are museums that a lot, lots of their collections happen during this time period during the sort of colonial, the Western European uh, power colonial times because they would just go out and they just collect stuff and send it back and that's back to the museums. Okay, like I mentioned before, it ended up being a five year Mission, the two functions of the mission were to uh, take readings of, uh, sort of basically surveying. Um, the majority of the surveying was to be done down in South America. As you can see, uh, most of what we'll talk about will be events and observations that Darwin made in South America, but it was a voyage that went all, in, all the way around the world, okay? And it wasn't necessarily you know just just they weren't they weren't going around the world in the quickest manner that they possibly could in fact where you see in South America the arrows going down the eastern coast of South America then up the western coast it actually was a lot of back and forth and a lot of it they would go into a port Darwin would jump off and they would continue to make all these readings and do the surveying along the coast right as Darwin would spend you know a significant amount of time running around the interior Darwin again, you know, sort of. We first got we we got first indication of this that Darwin had a weak stomach. He spent most of the five years being seasick. He never really got his sea legs. Um, some people believe that this affected his health for the rest of his life. The first part, the first two weeks of the trip, he was did nothing but lay in his hammock and eat raisins because that was the only thing that he wouldn't throw up. And so it was pretty miserable for Darwin in the beginning. He eventually got semi used to it, but he never quite really got used to, to being aboard the ship. So it was pretty, it, from that perspective, it was a pretty miserable five years for him. Okay, so they, uh, from England, um, in December of, not, of 1831, Darwin brings with him two different books to read. One was the Bible, and the other one was Lyell's Principles of Geology. Somebody remind us where we've seen or heard of Lyell's Principles of Geology before. With regards to what? You mentioned it. What's that? Yeah, uniformitarianism. So that was that. That was sort of James Hutton was sort of the the primary um, founder of uniformitarianism, but later on Lyell writes this consensus and really it, the, the principles of geology really serve as the main argument for uniformitarianism in, in the 1830s. Darwin is really, really interested in this book and so he has both of these books that have very sort of contrary sort of world views, right? The uniformitarianism versus maybe the catastrophism that, that, that most people were referencing to catastrophic events in the Bible. And so he's, you know, contemplating this. Darwin was, you know, he went to Christ uh, College. He was, he's, he, was he was a religious, you know, person. It wasn't like he was coming at this already having lost his religion. At this point, he was still kind of a religious person, still kind of struggling with, okay, what's the best description of the world? Okay, so their first stop, they, they were going to stop at a couple of different places, uh, Tenerife, um, was one place they were going to stop. They couldn't stop because there was a cholera outbreak, so they couldn't go ashore. They ended up a uh, few weeks later stopping at the Cape Verde Islands. So here, there are the Cape Verde Islands. They're off the west coast of Africa. It's now January of 1832, and Darwin can finally go 
ashore, and he starts to investigate things. He starts to do what the naturalist does: go through, say, like you know, go um, look at the look at the the wildlife there. At the same time, he was also reading uh, Lyell's uh, Principles of Geology, and so looking at geological things too. When he was on the Cape Verde Islands, he noticed two things. One thing that he noticed was that the animal life on the Cape Verde Islands were similar to the animal life from the west coast of Africa, from the continental Africa. So they were similar to that, but they weren't exactly the same. Okay, So there was this connection, there was this geographical connection between the islands being close, look, they look a lot like the continental ones, but they were also, you know, different. So he began to think, is there some sort of connection? Is there a reason why the organisms in Cape Verde Island look kind of like the continental ones when the environment in the Cape Verde Islands was very distinct than the environment on the co on coastal Africa? Why are they, why do they look, it, you know, if they were completely different, it would be easy to answer that. Well, these are completely different environments, so when they were created, this one was created, you know, the, the organisms on the Cape Verde Island were created for that particular environment, the or the animals and organisms on the west coast of Africa were created for that particular environment. So that was one thing that he noted, right? This, ge this sort of this geographical connection, but also difference, a geographical difference, okay? The second thing that he noticed is the coral. So on the Cape Verde Islands, um, he noticed that there was a band of coral that, I can't remember how high up uh, off of the, the, the coast it was, but it was, say, 10 feet off the coast of, of, of the island, right? So he, he had noticed that, okay, he sees the, the, what was the remnants of coral, right? We all know what the remnants of coral looked like. And he sees it, you know, elevated above the ocean. So now he's thinking about these things in terms of uniformitarianism, and he says, okay, what had to have happened? The ocean either had to have been up there at one time, or the rock had to have been down underneath the ocean because the coral need the ocean, right, to live, and then it would have had to have been uplifted. And so he's thinking about and contrasting these two things, um, and he continues to do this all the way through South America. This is part of his thought process. They leave the um, Cape Verde Islands, and they scoot across the Atlantic to Brazil. In Brazil, in, in Bahia, Brazil, up north, Darwin goes ashore, and he experiences the tropical jungle for the first time. He likens it to a blind man receiving his eyes for the first time. He's just totally blown away by the jungle. He's blown away by sort of the, the, the strict sort of laws that apply in the jungle. It's a prey on something or be preyed upon. It's like it's not this kind, gentle world out there. He notices that it's really harsh. It's like you're either going to kill or be killed, basically. Survival of the strongest. And so he, that's another thing that really influences him. Not only that, but as you can imagine, in the tropical jungle, it's a very different environment than you know an island, a temperate island uh, up in the Atlantic. It's very different from the UK, from England. Right? And so he's seeing all of these different kinds of species. He is really impressed with um, sort of the fear that army ants instill in all the organisms around him. When army ants start coming into a place, everything just is in a panic, fleeing the path of the army ants. Right? He's really impressed with that. Um, he spends a whole bunch of time sort of hopping along the coast, collecting things, and sending them and letters back to England. So ships that they would cross that were headed back to England, they would unload a whole bunch of specimens, unload a bunch of correspondence, right? Uh, he, he would send that back to his brother, to Henslow, to a number of other people in England. They would then print that, you know, de uh, disseminate it out into the public, and Darwin begins to form a reputation as a pretty decent um, naturalist within the scientific communities in England. Okay. Uh, next, he continues on south to Argentina. Um, uh, he, now I'm trying to think if it was in Uruguay or in Argentina that he goes ashore, he goes, no, oh, I think it was in Brazil actually. So in southern Brazil, he goes, he goes to shore um, with Fitzroy to visit an Irish slave owner, 
So he goes, he goes on to a plantation there, and he is really, this is where he and Fitzroy start their first sort of tension. So Darwin comes from, the Wedgwoods were long, um, had a long history of being anti-slavery. Uh, Fitzroy was, didn't really condone slavery, but he didn't, he also, he also was of the opinion that, you know, you don't readily mess with the old order, right? He's like, there are, you know, he's like, I don't condone slavery, but there are many benefits of it kind of thing, right? So they get into this big, this is their first sort of tension between the two. Um, Darwin, um, uh, Darwin then goes farther south, goes into Argentina. The first scene of the video, has anybody seen the video yet? The first scene of the video is Darwin in Argentina going, you know, with, in sort of pretty bad, broken Spanish, trying to talk about, you know, the fossils and buying fossils. He begins to uh, collect a number of different fossils uh, down in South America. These are just two of them, the Megatherium and the Glyptodon. So, these, so the Glyptodon is basically a giant armadillo. The Megatherium is a giant sloth. So now Darwin notices that, okay, not only was there a connection geographically between different organisms, but there's also a collection, um, there's also a connection between, um, a temporal connection, right? So you have these giant fossils in this place where you now see contemporary smaller versions of them. You know, you have sort of what we think of as normal sized armadillo down there. You have fossils of these big, massive, you know, mega armadillos. You have sloths down there. Has anybody ever been to South America, Central America, seen sloths? Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, I think that's pretty impressive. That massive sloth, that big sloth. I have no idea how slow, have, did you see the sloth movie? Barely. Barely. Yeah. So if you've ever seen a sloth, like the name suggests, it moves really slow. Um, what time is it? I have a sloth story. <laughs> so one time, one time when we were in, uh, when I was in grad school, we went down to Costa Rica and we were sampling fish all along the Caribbean side. So we're basically going from Panama um, up to the uh, Nicaraguan border, right? Uh, sampling every little stream for fish. And so there's two of us in the group that, that spoke Spanish. And so we'd always go pull off to the side of the road while everybody else would go start getting the seines out to try to do the fish. We'd have to go talk to the locals and say, hey, this is what we're doing. So they wouldn't freak out, right? You know, it's just, it's, that's, that's how you do good science, right? You don't, you don't just come in there and sample the fish and leave because then the locals are going to be going to be like resist you right so we're so we go and talk to them and the, the other people in our party are down there saying and we're talking to them and we're biologists and stuff and we had been to a town called limon has anybody ever been to costa rica the caribbean side have you been to limon so in limon in the plaza the town plaza there's a sloth and so we were telling this guy that that uh we uh we had checked out the sloth in limon and he's like oh that's nothing i I know where there's a mama and a baby sloth. We're like, really? And so we're like, you know, super curious about it. And so then we go get the other people, you know, because it's worth, you know, stopping your sampling to go see a mama with a baby sloth in the tree. He goes and he shows us it, right? And so sure enough, we go to the side. There's this slope. We're up, kind of up on top of the slope looking sort of straight across at the sloth. And the sloth's just sitting there hanging in the tree. And um, the baby sloth, let's see, was the baby? I think the baby sloth was on the belly, but you couldn't, see it very well right and so we're all with our pictures you know total tourists like trying to take these photos and trying to get it trying to get the face and the friendly local guy was like you know notice that we're trying to get the a picture of the face get good photos and like a like a good ambassador right he decides he's going to help us out so we're sitting there taking photos all of a sudden above our heads we see this big rock come out <laughs> Just, just drill the poor sloth, right? And sure enough, we're all just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Like, we're all scandalized, right? But sure enough, what happens? Both the sloth and the baby sloth slowly turn and look at us. And everybody goes from like instant, like, you know, instant, like, whore to taking their cameras out and taking photos. So we got some really good sloth photos. But the point is, they move really, really slow. There are small sloths down in South America, Central America, and fossils of really big sloths, okay? So Darwin sees this and he says, okay, 
there, there, maybe there's, there is some sort of, maybe these aren't independent creations, right? Maybe there's some connection between time, right? Maybe these large sloths, something happened, something changed. These large sloths had to change with the changing time and became evolved into, and he's not thinking, he, maybe he's thinking in terms of evolution, but he's changing into. Major, major sort of observation of Darwin. Okay, so now uh, as they turn their way south to go across, to go down towards the Straits of Magellan, to sort of scoop around and go to the other side, go to the west side of South America, another sort of mission, but it was sort of a personal mission of Fitzroy uh, aboard the aboard the Beagle was to bring back three of. Uh, uh, indigenous people that three years before he had taken from Tierra del Fuego, which is that southern sort of southern sort of a, a tip of South America, he had taken these three um, uh, native folks back to England to teach them English, to baptize them Christian, and to otherwise, you know, quote unquote, civilize them. One was a, uh, a teenage boy by the name of Jimmy Buttons. Another one was a young girl by the name of uh, Fuegia Basket, and then another one was a middle-aged man by the name of York Minister. And so Fitzroy, being a very religious man, very strict, you know, but also in sort of that humanitarian quote-unquote notion, uh, wanted to civilize, you know, the natives. This is a, this is a very common thing, you know, then and even a little bit now, but. Um, Oftentimes, they, it, it becomes sort of misguided, right? And so he brings them back. He teaches them English. He teaches them, you know, the proper tea time, how to hold, hold a teacup, all of these sort of things, how to use linens, how to use chamber pots. He then teams up with the London Missionary Society with a whole bunch of supplies with, you know, totally sort of good intentions, right, and says, okay, all of these native people, all these native people need is to be shown like the proper English way, and then their you know life is going to be great for them. And so they have all these supplies. They they come back down to uh, Tierra del Fuego, and they're going to you know uh, set up sort of this mission down there, and it's going to be everybody involved, right? So here, this just kind of shows you. Here's a here's an actual picture of them. Uh, some of them as pre-civilized and post-civilized, right? Um, but if you see down there at the southern tip of uh, southern tip of South America, it's a pretty harsh environment, right? Here, uh, that's Ushuaia, I think, is where the arrow's pointing to. But here is here are the Straits of It's a pretty harsh place. It snows. It's always windy, um, and the indigenous folk down there were really, really hardy, hardy people. Darwin was super impressed with them, with their ability to withstand cold. Uh, several people um, that you know were some of the early observers of of those people noticed that they wore hardly any clothes. They would coat themselves with grease and sleep on the bare ground in almost freezing temperatures. So this was a really, really hardy stock of people. So again, Darwin's starting to think now, he's starting to think in terms of prey or be preyed upon, survival of the strongest in human terms. So he's like, these, you know, these people, um, and, he, and, and he almost, and you see this a lot, and sometimes you even see criticism. You know, Darwin was coming from uh, an English perspective, right? A 19th century century English perspective, and sometimes he would view native people like a lot of people viewed native people in that time, and so from from sort of a, a racist framework, right? Darwin wasn't exempt from that, and he kind of viewed the, the here. This is a, just a picture of uh, the Torres del Paine, which are just on the other west side of uh, is also in Patagonia. All of that bottom third of Chile and, and Argentina is what we know as Patagonia. Very, very, it's heavily glaciated. Um, it's a pretty rugged, pretty harsh kind of environment. I just, but it's also very pretty. This is like some of the most classic climbing in, in the world. Uh, some of these. Um, here, this just gives you an indication of how hardy the, 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 the indigenous folks were. 
huge creatures, matted hair, painted faces. The one there on your bottom right, she was uh, um, the last living member of the Ona tribe, which is one of the tribes down there. Uh, the, the, the indigenous people in the bottom third of Chile were some of the only um, indigenous tribes that were never conquered by European powers. Um, the Araucanas there, eventually they settled a treaty um, in southern Chile, but the Spanish Empire never really made their way into the bottom third of Chile. For, uh, for be, and part of it was because of the harsh environment and because these were pretty harsh people. I mean, they're pretty, uh, pretty uh, I don't want, robust people, right? So, um, again, this is just gives you an indication of the kind of uh, people that the Fuegian or the kind of uh, culture and population that the Fuegian Indians that had come aboard came from. Okay, so Fitzroy and the crew uh, left a couple of missionaries from the London Missionary Society, along with the Fuegian Indian, well, along with um, Jimmy Buttons, Fuegia, and uh, Minister, Minister York, uh, with their tribe, and they spent the next day charting. The, the Beagle Channel, which became known as the Beagle Channel. Turn 10 days later, um, they, Matthews, who was the, the missionary, was in a state of panic, came and met them. After the, the crew had left, they had you know, set up all of these things, uh, left all of their missionary supplies and stuff. The, the indigenous people came stole everything, trampled the garden, beat up the missionary, and did all, all sorts of un, things we won't mention to poor little Jimmy Buttons. But it was basically a massive, massive uh, failure for Fitzroy. At this point, Fitzroy goes into a deep state of depression, and the relationship between Darwin and Fitzroy start, sort, of starts to, sort of starts to divide for the rest of the journey. Um, Darwin is, is also kind of seeing all of these things, formulating, making these observations and formulating sort of a, a more general, large scale sort of perspective. Okay, so they then, you know, come around the point, uh, the southern point of, um, of South America, and they begin to move up the, the west coast of Chile in, in 1835. They go to shore to Valdivia. Valdivia is just south of another city called Concepcion, where that had been the epicenter of a large earthquake. Um, he sees that the shoreline had been vertically uplifted about four feet out of the sea. Okay, if um, you're ever in, I I was just barely in northern Chile this summer, and there were earthquakes. You know, you'd look online, and there were earthquakes probably every four or five days in different parts of Chile. So this this region is very, very tectonically active. You know, there's the the Nazca plate that's just off off the off the shore there. It's a it's a it's an area kind of like Southern California where you have two different plates coming together. So there's a lot of activity there. There's a lot of volcanic activity. The the uh, southern third of Chile is full of these nice cone volcanoes, lots of them still very active. Um, and so Darwin's seeing all of this geological processes and he's saying, okay, there's enough going on here that he begins to really sort of accept the uniformitarian perspective, saying, okay, there the processes that are going on in a fairly frequent succession get added to the erosion and things that are happening every day. Um, is sort of uh, influencing him more towards the uniformitarian perspective. Not only that, but also when he was in South America, he goes hiking up in the Andes, and he sees seashells way up high in the Andes. In the Andes. And, it, and you don't have to hike that far to get pretty high up in the Andes. For instance, when I was just down there in July, I was in a town called Arica in northern Chile. It's right on the coast. It's part of the Atacama Desert. It never rains there. It's it's really impressive that way. There's just like, unless they're watering things, they don't have plants. It's just dirt. It's crazy. But more to this point, one day I took a tour from Arica up to the Altiplano, um, 
right up to the Bolivian border. Within 90 miles, well, first to this lake, within 90 miles, right? Within 90 miles of Arica, you take a bus, you go up to this lake, and this lake's 15,000 feet high. So within that short period of time, you're going from zero to 15,000 feet. And then at the back side of the lake, there um, is a volcano, right? And this volcano, uh, the peak of the, this volcano, if you were to keep going, which is you know, only a few more miles away, the peak of the volcano is almost 21,000 feet. And so you have this massive relief. That's pretty extreme up in northern Chile, but all along the coast of Chile, uh, Peru, um, and even up, into, uh, even up into Ecuador, you have in a very short distance, you, have, you go from sea level to something very, very high. So, so you could go to shore, you could hop on some horses, and you can be up to a pretty high elevation within a very short period of time. When Darwin would do that, he would see that there are seashells all over way, way high up. So again, thinking about these in uniformitarian perspective, either the ocean had to be clear up at 20,000 feet or 19,000 feet or 15,000 feet at one time, or at sort of in the wake of seeing this tecton the, these, these massive sort of earthquakes and things, he's then thinking, oh, or you can have a long period of time of this constant sort of uplifting of the mountains. And so he begins to sort of say, no, this is a much better explanation for what's going on than these catastrophic events. Okay, so after uh, after being uh, being in Chile for a little bit of time, he then uh, cruises out, goes up to the west coast of Africa. They then go out to the Galapagos Islands. On the Galapagos Islands, he is again just like totally blown away. The Galapagos Islands are about 600 miles off the coast of South America. They belong to Ecuador. Um, they're volcanic. And so it, this is really important. So you can see the volcanic activity. You can see the deposition. You say, OK, at one point, there was nothing here, right? And now, just like in the Hawaiian Islands, now with the volcanic activity, you see the formation of these islands. So he's thinking, OK, so then organisms had to make their way out to those islands. Um, this was a common stopping grounds for ships because one, you're about to cross you know, the, the Pacific, so you're going to be a long time uh, without contact to land. And sailors knew that on the Galapagos Island existed a whole bunch of really strange creatures. One that they were most interested in is down there on the left, were the land tortoises, okay? They really were keen on going to shore and checking out the land tortoises because one, they're big. They can be up to 500 pounds, okay? Sailors, yes, they might have been interested and curious about the tortoises, but the other thing that they really liked about the tortoises is that they could grab one, 500 pounds, bring it onto the ship, flip it on its back, and do what? Just let it sit there. So it's ectotherm, right? It doesn't have to eat. It also is, is, you know, is very sort of drought tolerant, right? So they could really do nothing. They could flip it on its back, tie it down, and three, four weeks later, they could then go kill it, make tortoise soup, right? And it was fresh meat. It was like refrigerated, quote unquote, fresh meat that they could have through the journey. So that's one of the reasons, even to this day, that a lot of the, the population of tortoises have been heavily sort of harvested and are endangered. In fact, I don't know if this is Lonesome George, but some of some of Lonesome George, anybody know who Lonesome George is? Anybody heard of Lonesome George? Lonesome George was who is he, Daniel? He's the last of that species. Yeah, he's the last of a particular species. So there's not just one species on the Galapagos, right? In fact, there may even be, depending on how you're defining the species, but you know, particular species per different island. The Galapagos are made up of uh, I think nearly 20 islands, maybe a little bit less than 20 islands. They're volcanic. Um, another sort of interesting creature is the marine iguana. Um, Darwin was really fascinated with the, with the marine iguanas. Um, he uh, noticed that you could approach the marine iguanas from the shores and they really weren't very fearful of you. You could even go up and grab a marine iguana. This is typical a lot of times of island populations too. They're not used to seeing you as a threat. He would go, 
take a marine iguana, he would chuck it into the, he noticed that they were jumping into the ocean and then coming back up. That was really curious, right? You don't usually see lizards doing that. He would go, he would chuck them in, he'd throw, he'd throw it in. The marine iguana would as quickly as possible sw turn around, swim, and come up back up to shore right next to him. So he starts thinking, okay, the behavior, what, what can explain this behavior? And so obviously the biggest threats to the marine iguana were the things that they would encounter in the ocean that would prey upon them. So they didn't want to be down in the ocean unless they were eating, right? Because they could, that's what the marine iguanas would do is they would go harvest, uh, they would go uh, harvest kelp and things like that. They would eat that and then they would come ashore. So there's a lot of resources down there for them to eat, but it was also a dangerous place. So if they weren't eating, they wanted to come back on shore. So Darwin does that, throws it in, it comes back on shore. Like a good, curious biologist, what would you do? Do it again, yeah. So he threw him back in, swooped around, came, and he could repeatedly do that. So Darwin, this really piqued uh, Darwin's interest. If you look down here at the bottom, the the slide, the Galapagos Islands, they're very, they're dry. They're they're a dry island, um, and uh, so that also sort of, you know, you, they're dry, and you can see in the background there that they're also volcanic, and so this also it's a very different sort of environment in the tropical islands. But he also said, okay, is there a connection between the environment here, the organisms that are here, and then also the organisms that could potentially come out here, uh, make it out into this place. So again, he's weighing the different sort of, um, he's weighing the different sort of models, that special creation model versus some sort of evolutionary model, a descent with modification model. What if he if he if he if you were weighing those those two different models? You're on the Galapagos Island. You see that you know all of these different islands seem to have their own particular species of let's say tortoises or finches, which we'll talk about here in a second. Evaluating that from these two different models we're contrasting, right? You would have to say, okay, from a special creation perspective, what would you have to assume? That what? Yeah, so each species had to have then be, been created on this island, this island, this island, that island, that island, right? If your descent with modification, you would say, okay, somehow, you know, species through time can change to their environments, and so maybe a species had, would have come out from South America to a new environment and then changed into those environments. Not only that, but, and this is, this is stuff that Darwin has actually evaluated. Not only that, but if in fact, each species was created in each particular little place originally, right? Then what happened after the original creation? A couple thousand years later, based on biblical chronology, you have the Noahic flood. So not only do you have to be specifically created in the place, you have to have the Noahic flood, and then, you know, Noah comes ashore on Mount Ararat. Right, and then Noah has to let out all of the things uh, over there in Turkey, and somehow these species have to then go back to each of these particular islands. And there are some still. So, you know, from our sort of in retrospect, we say, okay, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But there are still creationists that will still argue for that. And in fact, when it gets to to the point of arguing for those things, they sort of backtrack and say, well, we don't know how it happened. There has to be some sort of new supernatural explanation. And even some creationists will claim that angels brought them and distributed them after the Noahic flood to these particular places. And so, not to sort of, you know, not to sort of like this creationist or anything, um, but just to sort of reiterate that Darwin is thinking about these things. He's evaluating these things and saying, okay, which of these two models makes more sense? Okay, so I think there... Let's quit there, and when we come back, we will talk more about the Galapagos Islands. Any questions? That there had been sort of a, a uh, independent sort of creation for each of the islands, right? Not only that, but if you remember from the video, um, some of the stuff that some of the, the, the organisms that he was identifying, especially the birds, remember, remember when he got back to England and he showed it to his ornithologist, you know, uh, collaborator. The ornithologist was saying, was saying you know, th this bird that you identified as a mockingbird or a woodpecker or whatever, they, were, they, they weren't, right? They were all, do you remember what they were? They're all finches, right? And so he, 
saw them f from this sort of niche morphology perspective as being one of these other kind of birds when, act when in actuality they were all the same kind of birds that had just been molded into these different um, into these sort of different ecotypes or different species that resembled species that he was more familiar with that weren't closely related like like what we were seeing on the Galapagos. Okay, so independent sort of creation for each of these islands. Again, not to not to beat a dead horse, but he's still kind of struggling with these world views, right? Sort of the traditional special creation model versus some sort of other type of model where species actually did change through time and, th and things evolved, right? And so um, the other thing that um, really uh, w was a bit surprising to him, and, it, and, is, and is a bit surprising even to us to di the, the, this day when we go to certain islands, is that on islands you often find sort of creatures that are different or who that have evolved into different niches that are different than what we're used to on the continents, right? So for instance, here on the Galapagos Island, you see these tortoises. These are big, massive creatures, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, and they have filled this niche of uh, this sort of large animal, large grazing animal niche, right? What do we see as the large grazing animals in North America or Africa? Are they reptiles? No, typically what are they? They're typically mammals. And so this is, a, this is this sort of phenomenon that we call island disharmony. And we see that in lots and lots of different islands. So for instance, if you were down in the Indonesian islands and you were to go to you know, a particular island down there and you're running around, uh, you may encounter the top predator or the, or the organism that had evolved into that top predator niche as being a lizard, right? This would be the Komodo dragon. You see that too, there are, there are other islands where you have large uh, birds of prey that are the top predator of the islands. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to us, but then it also sort of leads us to, to ask, okay, why is that? Why on Komodo, why on the island of Komodo do you have these, these lizards that are the top predators? Why then in North America, what are our top predators? Bears, wolves, or mammals. In Africa, what are your top predators? Yeah, yeah, again, sort of mammals. So mammals have, placental mammals have been sort of top predators there. If you go to Australia, what are your top predators? Well, yeah, that's a good one, crocodiles. Crocodiles are still kind of top predators where they're at. But, like, what's that? Yeah, so they, so they would, so, or, or like um, Tasmanian wolf or something, right? Even though it's no longer with us, but it was a top predator. And there actually used to be this, like, if you look at, like, the megafauna of Australia, there used to be, like, this killer kangaroo that was a top predator, right? And so they're marsupial mammals, okay? This is a, this kind of island, because in a sense, Australia, this big island, this is this island disharmony. So, again, thinking about it in terms of what Darwin is struggling with, right? How, how, what best explains that? What best explains the, the uh, giant tortoises of the Galapagos filling this niche or being these, this top, this, this, this large, this niche of large grazing animal? Well, selection pressure, there's going to be selection pressure there, right? For sure. Okay, so on the islands, yeah, this is, this, that's, that, that's this big, you know, thing. Okay, Darwin's starting to see these connections that he started in Africa or in the Cape Verde Islands, right? These sort of geographical connections. Um, and he's just like, okay, they look like the animals that are in Africa, but they're also different than them. So maybe, you know, those animals, somehow there was these animals that came out and colonized and then since colonizing have, have changed, right? So again, with in the Galapagos, what could reach there? Is it, is, would it be easier for an ectotherm, like a tortoise or, you know, lizards or whatever, to, you know, kind of hitchhike on some sort of floating raft of, you know, de debris during a storm and then eventually drift out there and colonize the island? If they have to, you know, at 600 miles off the coast, it's going to be a pretty long journey um, and you're not going to have probably access to water. 
right? And so is it more likely that a mammal is going to survive on that, or is it more likely that a, a tortoise would? Well, obviously the tortoise, right? Because the sailors are, are taking those tortoises, flipping them on their back, and throwing them aboard their ship, and for the exact same reason, right? And so this island disharmony, and we see this in lots and lots of different places. How many of you have visited Hawaii? If you go to Hawaii, they're super, super vigilant uh, in the um, customs of like what's coming in, what's going out. And one of the reasons is, is that they have a lot of creatures out there, right? Are there any native snakes to Hawaii? What are there? What are there native things of? Birds, right? Insects, stuff like that. Because that's super far out there, right? It's it's really far out there. The birds come there. And then they change while they're out there. And importantly, they change in ways um, like, for instance, some birds evolve flightlessness and stuff like that. And they change in ways, behavioral ways, that make them particularly susceptible to continental creatures, exotic continental creatures coming out there and just decimating their populations. So this is something that conservation biologists have to deal with um, you know, all the time on islands for that exact reason. Jacob? In Hawaii? Yeah. I, I imagine it's, I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm guessing it's introduced. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they have some historic um, things that sometimes migrate with humans, right? So like pigs, wild feral pigs or stuff like that. But jet, that would island hop through Polynesian places like that. But yeah, I didn't know they had that deer out there. So I'm, I'm guessing it's exotic. Good question though. Um, okay, so here we are. Here Darwin's gone through this, you know, he's on this voyage. Um, after after uh, the Galapagos, they kind of make their way down to Tahiti. They go to Australia. They go around Australia. They go into the Indian Ocean, down around the, the tip of, of uh, Africa and back to England. But really, after the Galapagos, most of his main observations had been made. Okay, so what what are some of those main observations that we pointed out? Can anybody remember? What's that? Okay, geographic similarity between the Cape Verde Islands, right, and the continent, the African continental populations. Oceanic remnants being found really far above the ocean. Okay, so so sort of this these results of tectonic activity, whether it was the coral that were raised up in the Cape Verde Islands or the seashells that he came into contact with when he was cruising along in the Andes. Also, the earthquake that happened, he was in Valdivia, Chile, but it happened in Concepcion, Chile, which is not that far away. So all of those sort of geological observations. Anything else? Just to help, I've thrown in this, this is a new slide that isn't that I just put in over the weekend just to kind of summarize it for you. Okay, so in the tropical jungles, the thing that really was, you know, struck him was this uh, struggle for, for survival among the different organisms. In the Pampa, in uh, Argentina, mostly, he came ashore, found all of these fossils of the, the, the megafauna, right, saw that they were connected to contemporary species, so like the giant armadillo, uh, current small armadillo, the giant sloth, the current sloth, things like that. Um, and then finally down to the Galapagos Island that it seemed like there was a separate creation on each of the Galapagos Islands. Okay, so these were Darwin's main observations. These were the observations that he kind of generalized and put into, um, kind of formulated eventually his hypothesis uh, about evolution. Um, but it's, he's Okay, so 1836, like I mentioned, he makes his way back to England. He's been, he's been, you know, out, you know, traveling around for five years. He actually had developed somewhat of a reputation as a scientist, as a naturalist, through his letters back to his brother, back to Henslow and some other people. Um, and he was a little bit surprised when he got back that he actually had, he, he had actually become sort of a, you know, Okay, um, 
he uh, he 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 got back. He he began to you know basically um, um, think about other aspects of his uh, other aspects of his life of his life. In the video, you'll see that he ends up marrying Emma, right, which was his first cousin. In in, in you know in one sense, it's pretty good marriage because she's also comes from. You know, an even a wealthy part of their family. He comes from an upper middle class part of the family, so he really wasn't like too. As you saw in the video, he, will, he really wasn't you know too pressed to gain you know employment really quickly. He could kind of uh, hang out uh, out at Down House, the place that he ended up living, right, and work on you know just wading through all of the all of his collections and trying to trying to think about evolution um, trying to trying to come up with it with this with this new hypothesis he started his first notebook on the transmutation of species in 1837 so you know very soon after he came back he as the um, the uh, as the the video showed though he wasn't really he didn't really like the public eye right he, he kind of just wanted to kind of stay back in the sticks in the backwoods sort of of England and sort of do his thing, but didn't really like to engage in the debates, the scientific debates and things that were going on in the day. His brother was much more like that, as you saw in the video. It was in 1838, though, and so he didn't really have his, he didn't really have this hypothesis formulated yet. He, you know, was sort of convinced of uniformitarianism. He was convinced of that things actually did change, that things did evolve, that there was this, this descent with modification pattern was a, much more intellectually satisfying one than the special creation model, but he still hadn't totally formulated everything. It wasn't until 1838 when he was reading an essay by a, a guy by the name of Thomas Malthus, who was an English clergyman and economist, that it all just sort of came together sort of in, in an instant, right, and it just dawned on him. This, is, this explains, this is the underlying process that explains all of this other stuff, right? And so what Malthus argued for and you know he wasn't a biologist he was an economist but the <laughs> issue that was particularly interesting to Malthus was why was human misery right why did it seem and then he's a clergy too so that's going to be of interest to him so why do we see always seem to have the haves and have nots in societies no matter what happens no matter which society you go to it generally seems that in that society, there are certain people that are doing well, you know, surviving, doing great, and other people that are just really struggling to survive, right? Malthus wanted to know why that was. No matter what happened, you know, you, we're looking at, you know, 19th century stuff. If you look in the Americas of the 19th century, you have all of these different sort of uh, religious movements going on, um, these communal sort of uh, experiments, there, there was all this shakeup. The same thing was going on in England where you have all of a sudden, okay, we're going to try to form better societies, we're going to maybe live more communally, things like that. They would do that, but then eventually, no matter what would happen, eventually it would kind of go back to haves, haves, nots, and human misery, right? No matter, no matter where you were looking at, right? And so math is which is sort of represented here in this Malthusian growth graph. And basically what it says is that resource, the ability to develop resources, right, the ability to extract resources or use resources, whether it's food or, or whatever, right, is sort of a linear function in time. You know, we can improve our methods of, of agriculture. We can, you know, fell more trees and add more more fields of, co of corn or potatoes or whatever, right? But this is a linear growth, okay? So here at the bottom of the graph, the time zero, you see, okay, our resource quantity is at two and our, or we, we, don't, we don't want to worry about those units, but we look at the red line and the blue line, blue line representing the resources, the resources, there are more resources than there are to the population. Right, so what does that mean? If there's more resources, it's good times, right? Everybody's eating, everybody's happy, content, you know, Thanksgiving dinner every day or whatever, right? So as you grow, as you go through time, 
Yes, you increase the amount of resources that you're able to, you know, harvest, right? More people. Also, to, uh, as your population has lots of resources, what do we tend to do? Yeah, we tend to have, we tend to, we tend to have, you know, babies, right? So as we're having babies, our population is growing, and we begin to grow. If you look from one to two to three, we have a certain kind of growth. It's getting a little bit faster, a little bit closer. There's not so much of a gap between the linear growth of the resources and the geometric growth of the population. But eventually what happens as we continue to grow, everybody has three kids, right? Then every, all, the, all of the three kids then have three kids, and then all of the... You know, nine kids then have three kids, and so now you're up to 27, and all the 27 kids have, then have three kids, all of a sudden you're up to 81, right? And so you're growing in a geometric sense. And so what Malthus was saying was because of this, because of this potential for geometric growth in human populations, eventually we get to a point where our population growth outpaces our resource growth. That's all he was saying. And he was looking at it from very sort of almost humanitarian perspective from a clergy and economist and saying, okay, this kind of explains why we tend to always settle on this sort of situation. So then Darwin looks at this, he reads this, and it dawns on him. That's, the, that's it. You know, that's, that explains it. This happens in human populations. This same thing is going to happen in animal populations or in plant populations. You're going to have animals that have plenty of resources. They're going to they're going to, you know, outpace their resources through their geometric population growth, and eventually they are going to have to then get to a situation where not all of the organisms are going to survive, and there's going to be characteristics of certain organisms that do survive, right? Those characteristics are then going to be passed down to... It dawns on, it dawns on Darwin that this struggle is, existence is going to um, uh, increase the number of favorable traits or characteristics that an organism has, get passed down, and the unfavorable ones are going to be uh, are going to be destroyed, or how we say it now is selected out. Okay, so um, next 20 years he spends looking at all sorts of other stuff. You know, he has a massive collection publishing papers, doing all of this stuff. Five years of collecting data is, and any of you who have gone on, been in research projects where you collect data, sometimes the, the data collecting is short, and it takes you years to, you know, eventually publish that data. I still have stuff from my PhD, which is a long time ago, that I still haven't published. So that's Darwin. He's, you know, doesn't necessarily have to go out and work nine to five. He can just kind of, he can just, you know, kind of hang out there out at downhouse. And, um, uh, and, and publish his things and think about it. But look at the time period. 1838, he reads about Malthus. He's formulating all this stuff. It's not until a couple of decades later that he actually publishes The Origin of Species. The he wasn't super gung-ho about about publishing it, and he wanted to get so much data behind it, he wanted it to be so persuasive from that perspective that he could just publish it, and nobody would argue about it, and he wouldn't have to, like, you know, debate anybody or do any of that stuff. It didn't end up happening that way, but that's what he wanted. And it wasn't until somebody else came along that really stimulated him or, like, encouraged him to actually publish. And so in 1858, uh, he gets hold of an essay by a guy by the name of Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace, um, he was he was he was sort of like working class Darwin. He traveled around the world, but collecting specimens and selling them back to museums and things like that. He did most of his stuff in in the Amazon, but he came up with the exact same idea that Darwin did. And interestingly enough, interestingly enough, the thing that sort of sparked him to sort of synthesize this same idea was also reading Malthus's uh, paper on population growth. And so he does this. Darwin sees that, he, he realizes that, oh, okay, I need to publish this. He doesn't just do it, you know, pretend he doesn't see uh, Wallace's uh, essay, but instead he says, let's publish this thing together, you know, to Darwin's credit. You know, scientists don't always do that. Sometimes scientists get greedy and try to scoop other people. Uh, but, but Darwin doesn't do this. 
they present it at the uh, they presented it at a, at a meeting and then publish it in the, the journal of the Linnaean Society. Darwin then publishes Origin of Species a year later in 1859. Um, it was pretty evident that Darwin came up, you know, from a science from the scientist perspective that Darwin, you know, was thinking about this long before, and that's why Darwin gets most of the credit. You know, we don't really hear too. That's one of the reasons that Darwin um, gets most of the credit. Um, because you know he all now he has his book in 1859, has all this data to support it and things like that. So so Darwin becomes sort of the the father of evolutionary biology, right? The other reason is that Wallace, after this, kind of went. There was a there was a movement late the late part of the 19th century. Um, there was a spiritualist movement where people were doing lots and lots of seances. You sometimes will see this in movies of that time period. And so there was, all, there was like, like a lot of scientists and religious people and everybody else were super into seances and stuff. And so Alfred Wallace kind of got involved with that. And that kind of, um, that kind of sort of lowered his, his scientific reputation. So that was kind of another reason that, that Darwin sort of seems to get all the, all the credit, but to, to, Wallace's, you know, kudos to Wallace because he, you know, independently came up with the exact same idea that Darwin did. Okay.